and good afternoon. My name is Priyanka Bhuya, and I am pleased to welcome each and every one of you on this orientation program on trauma informed and responsive services for healthcare and human service work. Now, I would like to request Dr. Gitartha Roy Medhi, Facility Director of Parthana Orthopedic and Super Specialty Hospital, to introduce today's guest speaker. Thank you so much. Uh, very good afternoon to all of you and sorry for the delay due to this traffic jam. Uh, so we are really very fortunate today that we have uh, Professor Mary Roctis from uh, University of Pittsburgh in the US. Uh, she is uh, also a trauma come emergency nurse come a social worker and experience in psychology. So I hope that her speech today will bring a great impact in us and all together following her suggestions, following her teachings, uh, we can concentrate more into this patient centric and patient safety measures. Uh, now I request uh, our director, Mr. Sonu Singh and Mr. Asrafal Khandakar to felicitate our guest. Asraf. Aji mane ami rogir khurokha aru mane medical error ei dutta bostu lekho rakhi pele first time eta mane educational academic session eta rakhisu jitur babe ami University of Pittsburgh US er pora professor Mary Rocktis Take to Gialo in Mane invite Kurisu, I'll take it a man Nimontron Sikar Guru Yalo Ahise, Iman Duropora, uh Teketare faculty member, Aru Moi Mane Bisakur Colmane Amar Staffe no Kisuman Bahira Manuase, Kisuman students who are Bele Hospital of Kisuman Manuase, the Ebur Mane Tehete Zitu Ruporot Mane as a topic to Dise. Apunar Mane psychology ruporo, the reta patient, mane centric setup at a mikeneke kam kuribolage. Aru Amar Hospital con Jeto Trauma and Orthopedic Hospital Hoy. Aru He Trauma Aru Orthopedic Court, Ekator Obikota Bohud Bisi, Ekadekizoni PhD holder, Vane Senior Narso Hoy. Aru Emergency, Aru Emergency Kiaro Ruporoto, Ekator Obikota Bohud Bisi, Zitu Report Ekatazi, Amak Zonaise, Aru Amar Zunbur Clinical Staff, Nursing, Aru Mane Technical Staff to Asse, Kaluka Bohud Kinikota Ekatopora, Tikibo Parise. So it will be a successful session, Bully Moikom. I would like to say what an honor it is to be invited to speak today. Um, I'm a nurse by training, and uh, my PhD is in social work, and I work in the intersection between social wellness and health. So this is a great honor to speak today to the staff here at this hospital. Um, I'm going to talk about the impact of trauma, not only chronic stress, but also traumatic stress. I think that's an important topic for India. It's certainly a very pertinent topic for the United States right now. And I have received nothing but um, wonderful treatment here in India, the United States and India are good friends. My home city of Pittsburgh is home to many Indians uh, from Chennai. And so it's such a pleasure to be here in the north with all of you. I have felt very much at home and I look forward to talking with your team to hear about what it's like working here in India um, with people who have experienced trauma. I think I'll learn far more today from all of you then I have come here. So thank you very much for the opportunity. As much as I love India, I do want to get back home to my family, my animals, and my students. Um, I'd like to thank you once again for inviting me here. Um, as you heard, I am a registered nurse in the United States. I also have a PhD in social work because I found that it was such a great intersection, right, of nursing, caring for people in both their mind and their body. 
I'd like to tell you a little bit about myself and my, where I come from. So this is our university building, the University of Pittsburgh. This building was built at the turn of the last century. Uh, it's 36 stories. It's the, one of the largest classroom buildings in the world. My office is right around here. Um, when we win an American football game, not a soccer game, as you call it, but for us, it's football. We put what we call the victory lights on. So they must have won like one of the few games uh, last year. So that is a picture of our university. We're also a major research one hospital in university. So um, that's the great thing about um, working at, as we call it, Pitt. The University of Pittsburgh, if I can brag a bit about my hometown, um, was home of the polio vaccine. Uh, Jonas Salk wa was uh, created polio vaccine there back in the uh, 40s. And then mo more recently, um, Dr. Starzl and liver transplants came out of the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. So we have a very large medical center. In fact, I can't tell you how many, I, I don't know how many doctors we have, but we also have a nursing school, uh, a dental school, school dentistry, pharmacy. So obviously social work, right? Which is where I'm from. So I just wanted, you were really busy. So I wanted to keep this to be a brief presentation today, but I wanted to talk a little bit about stress and trauma. I wanted to touch briefly on the social determinants and relationship to health and genetics. I want to talk about the relational issues that come up when clients come into the hospital to access your services for a routine surgery or for um, um, emergency surgery. And I wanted to talk about, importantly, about trauma-informed primary care as a model. And then last, but it always comes last, but it really should be first, is self-care for workers. I know when I was a nurse, um, self-care was probably the last thing that was on my agenda and it should have been right at the top. So a little bit about my colleague. Um, I work with the person who I do this work with is, her name is Yodit Betru. She's from Ethiopia and she directs our social work program. And I'm a research professor, so I teach mostly research have a pretty diverse research agenda. Um, I teach our joint uh, hospital and social work students. And our mission is to transform uh, the world. Uh, it's not a small mission, but our mission is to help students address oppression in all forms and to transform the world for better. And I think that's a mission that you also would share here. So, how much, how much chatter the social determinants of health get here in India? Do you talk much about social determinants of health? I mean, is it something that's talked about in your medical school classes? Is it taught at all? Do people talk about it? Anyone? No? We talk a lot about it in, um, in the U.S., this idea that social determinants of health include the social and economic conditions that influence the health status of our clients. So that social determinants of health have to do with economic stability, the neighborhood and the built environment, uh, the social community context, as well as your healthcare setting, right? And, um, and uh, certainly education so that when, so it's a holistic view of the fact that there are factors that influence health beyond just sort of what's going on in the physical body. So I, I bring this up because I think it's, uh, even though I'm talking about stress, I think it's a better, I wanted to bring this up as a framework because social determinants in health are really important. We saw in the United States, we had, I believe, over a million die due to COVID in the last two years. 
And, you know, we're a, a wealthy nation for some, but not for all, right? And so what we found were social determinants of health determined who got ill and died and who remained healthy. So someone like me, white skinned, white female, remained healthy. Why is that? Well, you know, I have an advanced, you know, for us, it's all about class in the United States. I mean, I have an advanced degree. I have white skin with tattoos, but white skin. Um, I have an education. I have a single person home, right? I have an income um, that's not great, but it's, it's a, a solid income. I have good health insurance, right? All of these things, oh, and most importantly, my job didn't require that I go to teach. In fact, my university shut down. So I, didn't, I was teaching remotely, right? But my neighbor down the street had a very different uh, set of social determinants. She's a single parent, right? She has a high school education. Uh, she lives in an apartment with three or four other people. She has a young child and she works at a dollar store that remained open during uh, the pandemic. So who would be more likely to get COVID, right? It makes a difference, social determinants, and who we see in the, in the U.S. is getting sick. And so the groups that were the most ill with COVID at the, uh, the start of the pandemic in 2020 were primarily the elderly, right, and also the poor. So the people, you know, and people who were brown or black. So Hispanic, African-Americans, which uh, for us, our minority groups are uh, are um, Spanish, Hispanic, Spanish speaking peoples. We don't have a lot of indigenous tribes left, mostly in the Southwest. And then, of course, African-Americans. Those are the people who had the worst determinants and ended up being the sickest. I'm not sure how it was in India, but I'd also like to point out who's most likely to have a traumatic injury, right? This is another place where social determinants come into play. So again, my worst injury is falling off my office chair, which I did do, I might add, but I didn't get hurt, right? I, I, you know, but if I am working as a day laborer, as someone who works uh, picking up work daily, uh, you know, in order to survive, I can guarantee you that there's no safety in those jobs and people get hurt. Uh, you know, my daughter is a trauma nurse at uh, the University of Pittsburgh and she uh, flies in the helicopters for, you know, when there's accidents. And she talks a lot about, she doesn't say, mom, all these social determinants of health, but she talks about them in her own way when she talks about who she's seeing are the people who are coming in with bad trauma. They're people, you know, uh, who lack the resources. And so, you know, they're getting terrible burns or they're breaking bones. Um, and so I, I like to lay that out because I think it's an important background when we're thinking of and who is likely to experience stress? There are generally the people who have the worst social, the, the social determinants that are likely to make them sick, and they're likely to come into your hospital. So here's where I'm going, just going to segue into talking about stress. So we all have stress. Stress is a natural part of life. I think it's probably even more so in India, where you have, um, you know, roads that are, you know, in traffic jams uh, and, uh, you know, lots of people. So, but positive stress is good, right? Like, you know, we want positive stress. So when I'm running in a, a marathon, which I do back in the U.S., I want a little stress because that, you know, gets me ready to do 26 miles, right? It's a positive kind of stress. There's tolerable stress, right? Uh, stress that's temporary and it's buffered by supportive relationships. So maybe your job is stressful, uh, goes through a stressful period, but you have supportive people. In India, you have certainly very strong family relationships and friend, lifelong friendships. 
that seemed to be a form of support. Uh, and then, <clears throat> excuse me, we end up sort of on the bottom of the range with prolonged activation of stress. So people, uh, you know, are, who are under repeated stress on that doesn't, and they have no mitigating, no buffering factors in terms of family, no protective relationships or very difficult relationships are likely to experience stress at toxic levels, which of course impairs their adrenal glands with that kind of stress, makes concentration difficult. So this is kind of a chronic stress, which is different than post-traumatic stress. Now in the United States, we do talk a lot about stress, particularly about um, unrelenting chronic exposure to stress. So for many people, that's, again, when they're living in places and in, in situations where there's a lot of um, reasons to feel stress, right? They're chronically unemployed or hungry or their, their job is very hazardous. And there's pretty good evidence that supports that chronic exposure alters our physiology. Certainly our, our the hypothalamus, thalamus, you know, adrenal glands, but also epigenetics that it can potentially turn off and on some gene expression. We've seen that in mouse models. We haven't uh, experimented on people, but, um, there are various factors that can lead to uh, things, stress getting toxic. And when people come in to your, uh, your setting, your hospital here. So I'm going to say this is true for all of you. And it certainly it was true for me as a nurse. And also when I worked as a, a therapist working with women uh, after sexual assault that repeated or indirect exposure to trauma in the cause of, of your work can certainly lead to some post-traumatic stress. We talk a lot about oppression stress in the United States. I'll, I'll, I'll touch on that in the next slide. Childhood stress. We talk about adverse childhood experiences. So adverse childhood experiences are things uh, like living in a very violent neighborhood, uh, witnessing domestic violence in the home, uh, being the victim of abuse or neglect or sexual abuse, right? Um, and so we know that adults, and this is based on the United States, who report uh, two or five or more ACEs, we have good population studies that show us that those people have poorer health. And untreated stress following a traumatic event, which I'll talk about. Now, you may wonder what oppression trauma is, or maybe you know, but in the United States, we talk a lot, particularly in the School of Social Work, about oppression trauma. I don't know how much you follow the news from the United States. The world follows us. Unfortunately, in the U.S., we don't always follow the world, but... Um, we have a lot of violence in our country, right? Um, in my country, gun violence in particular, but also uh, police violence on uh, brown and black pe people, right? And so this, so that's the extreme, right? Like Rodney King or um, Trayvon Martin. I mean, I could name a list of people, black men who've been killed by the police, but it's every, it's more, it's less dramatic than that for most people. So everyday devaluation that harms health. So we talk about racism, sexism, gender-based oppression, and ethnic oppression on a day-to-day -day basis. That definitely is a form of stress. My Yodit, who has, Dr. Betcher, who uh, does this work with me, has talked about what it's like to be uh, a black woman in the United States. And she said it's not the obvious things, but she said it's the accumulation of all the small slights and slurs that she said, you know, really feel oppressive. Um, yeah. But let's talk about trauma 
acute trauma, not the chronic kind like Yodid has experienced, but let's talk about trauma secondary to violence. And violence, I say it very broadly. For example, climate disasters are violent acts, not perpetrated by people, but, um, you know, monsoons, certainly floods, uh, tsunamis, earthquakes, right? So the climate's changing and we're having a drought, right? So uh, there's trauma secondary to those kind of disasters. Uh, in my country, it tends to be certainly earthquakes, but more hurricanes and tornadoes, which destroy entire swaths of the city, right? There's sexual crimes, rape and incest. I mentioned that I worked on a study, a research study, and we did treatment with women who, and men who had uh, experienced uh, uh, sexual assault. Um, being a victim of a violent crime, so uh, attempted murder, interpersonal violence, community violence. I mentioned we have a lot of guns in the US. We have unregulated gun ownership, lots of community violence. My daughter is caring for or life flighting a 16 year old all the time who's, you know, bleeding out because of gun violence and close witness to violent crime. So, you know, you may say, well, we don't really see these people, but I would argue that you actually do see them. They're just not coming in necessarily saying, yeah, I experienced this, or, you know, we had to move from this village to here because of this, and during that time, we were in a refugee camp. They're not gonna tell you necessarily about the violence in their home. But they're coming in and they have that history, right? So when I worked with uh, the Women's uh, the Center for the Victims of Violent Crime, that's what we called it at the time, I worked, I did therapy with women who had experienced recent sexual assault or in some cases uh, they, it had happened in the past. And what happened was as a result of this post-traumatic symptoms, flashbacks, anxiety, depression, re-experiencing trauma, nightmares, their lives got so disrupted they couldn't function. They lost their jobs, they lost their homes, their relationships fell apart, so they, they went into therapy. The point, and, and that was what we were testing. Does rapid and early treatment, um, is it more impactful than after people have had an assault and they wait and these secondary things happen, right? So that was part of what we were treating was, you know, how is a, is a rapid response the right way to, to deal with trauma? And as it turns out, it is. Because what happens is, at least in the U.S., then people go on to experience symptoms that make it really hard for them to function. And then that impacts all the second, the, the next circle, right? Their family, their work, their jobs, their relationships. Oh, thank you. So, when people come to you, and this is where we have some audience participation. <laughs> when people come to you here in your hospital, <coughs> How can you, do you, I should say, or how can you treat everyone as though there may be some trauma in their life? And I'd like to argue, I have argued in other places, that anyone who's lived through COVID this last two years has probably experienced some trauma. Someone has died, someone has become very sick, someone has lost their job, Someone has experienced bad things. So um, this idea of, I know this year when I was teaching, I approached teaching with sort of the idea along that all of my students and all of my peers have probably had some sort of trauma in the past year. So when people come to you, how, you know, how, how do you practice healthcare primary health care in a trauma sensitive manner. So is there a universal trauma screener in your work? Do you universally assess for trauma? 
Um, I'm, 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 that's a question. I'm, I'm curious. Plus, I, I need a drink of water here. My, my poor husband recently had an experience where he, um, he had to go to the emergency room for a, a kidney and bladder related problem. And during the assessment, you know, here the man is in, you know, real pain, but they're asking him about whether or not he's experienced violence at home. And he looked at me like, or what the heck? And I said, this is called universal trauma screening, you know, like just answer the question. And so, you know, so even though he came in for, you know, urinary retention, they were asking him about whether or not they were asked, they were doing universal screening, right? They could have probably waited until we felt a little better, but they were still doing that as part of the assessment. Is there a universal trauma sort of screening here? No? Okay, so you might say, what is a universal trauma screen? Well, there are a couple, I mean, sometimes it's as simple as a few questions like they did with my husband. Have you experienced violence in the home? Um, and by the way, they did it when I was in the room. They probably should have like not done that. They actually should have done it when they were alone with him, right? Have you experienced violence in the home? Um, have you, you know, uh, have you been in, you know, I mean, that's just really sort of the, the baseline question. So it's questions about violence in the home. And here I'm going to show you, uh, so it's hard to see this, but um, this is also for you. This is actually about your own trauma symptoms. But I would say that there are some pretty good universal uh, trauma screeners that can be uh, put into place in your routine assessments. You can ask questions. There are some really good screeners, screening tools. Have you experienced violence in the home? Have you witnessed, uh, you know, so basically ha have you been the victim of violence recently? So it's this idea of first, I'm sorry, this is really not great, but recognition, realization, response, respect, and resilience. So the first step is recognizing in screening, it's trauma recognition, um, that someone has experienced trauma and just not maybe the broken bone that brings them in, but maybe, you know, there are some other trauma in their past and that trauma can interfere with their uh, psychological sort of recovery with accepting treatment recommendations because trauma does in, you know does influence how people make decisions and they often don't make the right decisions or the ones in their best interest so why is this person you know presenting with this issue at one time and you know you also not only will review if there's trauma, but also their strengths and cultural and racial and uh, tribal considerations in meeting their need. So, um, you know, who is a support? Uh, what was helpful? And uh, trying to find out about, you know, what... Now, I realize that I am giving this my United States lens. But I would like to say that, I, and I know that, um, you know, there are many things in India that, uh, uh, that are the same as the United States and some things are different. For example, uh, the sexual assault rates are, are much higher here, as well as violence in the home. So say someone comes to your clinic for my, minor surgery and during your assessment, you pick up on the fact that she's not sleeping, she's really anxious, she's very hypervigilant, she has a startle response that's very prominent, and she keeps looking over her shoulder, and you know that this patient is more anxious than they would be about what is a routine procedure. So you have to ask yourself, what's going on here, and what can you ask in this culture, right? What's culturally acceptable? And how can you talk about trauma events and emotional consequences? That's my question for you because I don't work in your system. So 
I mean, to what degree can you do trauma-informed primary care here? Can, or do, do currently? Can you start with recognition by doing screening and then start to understand the impact of that and then begin to respond? And respect and resilience are very important. Um, you base your care approach always on building on the strengths that the family ha that the patient has. So I'm just curious, would someone please talk so I can stop talking uh, and hear about what your work is like? Oh, I'm going to ask the nurses in this room because, you know, we're, because <laughs> we're a sisterhood. So tell me about your work and what your experiences of people who've had trauma or your suspicions of it. Do you find that people are willing to talk about some events that happened that were traumatic for them? No. So you have, a, a, and that's, you know, the stigma. We just finished a study of uh, Nepali immigrants in Pittsburgh. We have a lot of Nepali uh, who have resettled in our city. And uh, there were a lot of suicides. And so that was of great concern. I mean, you don't like escape from, you know, ethnic conflict, live in a refugee camp, finally get relocated to the United States and have, you know, a chance at a, at a life. And then to then kill yourself is, um, you know, it's a tragedy on multiple levels, right? So we're trying to figure out why these mostly young men were doing it. And one of the hardest things, now me as a white person, was very hard for people who didn't want to talk to me. But my research assistant is from, um, is, uh, she's from, again, south of India. We have tons of southern Indians in Pittsburgh. So she did all of the interviews. And she found that people really didn't want to talk about mental health or trauma, right? It, everything was, uh, the, what's the Hindu word for crazy? Pagal? Right. So the, the, that term was used all the time that um, if we, they went to talk, because this is a group of people that were highly, highly stressed, had lots of trauma. Right. They lived in Bhutan. They were kicked out of Bhutan. Uh, they had to go to refugee camps. They lived there. Some of them, some of the kids were born there. Then they had to be relocated to Pittsburgh, you know, winter. It, it looked nothing like Nepal, right, um, or Bhutan. I mean, it was totally foreign, new language, new currency, no job. You know, it, it, it's pretty hard to find more stressful situations than that. But the reluctance to talk about, and many of them had survived, you know, the conflict that happened uh, when they were, um, when they had to leave Bhutan. And um, so they had experienced, some of them had experienced, uh, you know, violence. Uh, they had been, they had to run for their lives, but they weren't going to talk to anyone about that, which is really, you know, and in fact, the, and to the fact that suicide became a viable option for some of the young men who had sort of had no hope. They, and had problems with the recurrent nightmares and the problem sleeping. And so they thought, well, I'm just crazy. So, and no, you know, and that carried such stigma that they felt that, you know, suicide was a viable option. So I, I you know, I bring this story up to say it's, you know, it's in my country too. Yes, the uh, United States has less stigma about talking about mental illness than other countries, but it doesn't mean that we are without stigma. It's still, um, we still, you know, we have a lot, we talk a lot about it, but it's hard sometimes access is more than just having a clinic, right? It's people going. We had resources for these young men. 
but they weren't going to use them because of the, of the community stigma. And so we worked a lot with uh, community or after we were done talking to the few people that would talk to us, we're trying to work in creating, we have a, a lot of nurses who actually, a lot of young women go into nursing uh, from the Nepali community in Pittsburgh. So we're working with them to make them like community mental health nurses so that there's this opportunity for people to feel a little more comfortable talking to someone, right? But this idea of at least, if people don't want to talk about it, at least asking in a screening question, letting even asking gives them permission to perhaps tell you about it. They may not, but it at least lets them know that if they answer yes to that screening question about having experienced trauma, that at least you're willing, you're listening. And that's important because if they come in and they have a lot of unresolved trauma, it will be difficult for them to, you know, I mean, physiologically to rest, to heal, to tamp down that stress response, to make better, clearer decisions about their health care. So at least asking people is the first step. They may not tell you, but at least they know that it's okay if they want to, that you're listening. And that's the most important thing. Um, the other thing is about patient-centered and controlled care. Again, that would be, you know, that goes down a little bit more. But it at least gives them the idea that it's emotional, it's safe to bring this up. I'm not sure how you totally change public opinion about stigma uh, around mental health. As I said, we're experimenting with this notion of community-driven uh, nurses and uh, specially trained volunteers. We've also learned that for translation, we can't have members of the community translating because then everyone knows everyone's business. Uh, so that some people have to, you know, some of the therapists have learned a little bit in Nepali. Pretty appalling, you know, our skills at it, but, you know, nonetheless. Um, and also, um, we've had to become more approachable. So this idea of accessibility. So even asking that screening question about violence at least makes you approachable and accepting. Um, you know, one of the things we also found that was a problem was during COVID, we couldn't, people didn't have access to computers or anything like that. So that was, a, uh, there was no access. So that meant people weren't getting services at all during that period. So this is where we talk a little bit about all of you, what brings you to this work, right? So you work with people who've experienced some sort of trauma, right? broken bones, uh, they're getting surgeries, uh, maybe it wasn't an accident that brought them here, but nonetheless, um, if, I don't know how hospitals are in India, but in the United States, we've had what we call the great resignation. And what that means is that a lot of our doctors and nurses have left. Two and a half years post-COVID, they basically just left. Um, Sometimes my daughter is, was when she worked on the floor, a trauma unit. It was all, you know, it was a second level trauma. She would have 10 patients. There was only two or three nurses. So we've had this great resignation of nurses and doctors. You might think a doctor, all that time spent in medical school and they're just walking away from it. But it was a combination of many things. Uh, I could go on and on about how we finance healthcare in the United States, but a lot of it was was just this overwhelming sort of chronic stress. And so it's great that you're drawn to this work, that you want to help people, that um, you want it, you're seeing people when you're a doctor or a nurse or a, a tech, you're often seeing people at the most vulnerable time in their lives when they're the least able to advocate for themselves when they're the sickest, right? And that's um, a, a kind of, um, it's not an honor, but it is a special thing to take care of people when they're at their worst. And often they're really 
not nice. <laughs> uh, you know, my, my daughter would often call me at the end of her 12 hour shift and tell me all the names she was called or, you know, uh, how a family member, you know, complained about her not getting to the patient, you know, in a nanosecond or et cetera. So we're not also not seeing people when they're their most vulnerable, they may be their most unpleasant. So what's, I think that we all, how do you build in uh, the things that help you continue to do this work? Because there is secondary trauma, right? <clears throat> One of the things, can workers meet criteria for post-traumatic stress disorder, which is that idea of re-experiencing sort of the trauma of feeling hyper alert, anxious, nightmares, um, you know, so yes, actually 70% um, in this study in the US reported one distress symptom. And this just isn't doctors and nurses, it's also firefighters, policemen and women. Um, I know when I worked on the uh, victims, the Center for Victims of Violent Crime, sometimes, oh, that's okay. Sometimes after a particularly difficult session, I used to feel like I needed to like, I don't know, stick my head under water and just like clean it out because it was so hard to listen to that, to the pain and the suffering and knowing that someone inflicted that on other people. So the most, you know, so um, for many people, it's intrusive thoughts, not being able to put work out of their, out of their head. But there's often uh, physiological arousal. So you might feel sweaty, or uh, kind of hyper alert, you may have psychological distress, again, you may feel highly anxious, you might have a hard time enjoying things, you might have some depressive symptoms. And um, there can be some really long term uh, sort of results like burnout, where you leave, which is what happened to most of our doctors and nurses who left, they just got burnt out. So I would say that the most important thing to do is that you just need to, uh, we have this thing about making your own meaning, but you know, you have to find ways to sort of manage the, the pain and the stress that you often get from working with people in pain, right? You've been trusted to do that, but it also has an impact on you. So there are many things that you can do. It's not, um, you know, you're very, the thing that impresses me about India is how resilient Indians are. It's just unbelievable to me. Um, Sorry, I'm going to interrupt. Yeah. Since Dr. Jibani is our Oh, I'm sort of coming up on the end, but. Um, so I think uh, there's this recognition that uh, the people who care for these people also need to, to do self-care, right? And it's not about going to a spa. It isn't selfish, but don't, you know, confuse uh, consumerism with self-care. It's about um, <clears throat> finding out ways for you to leave the work behind. Um, so, you know, actually in my school, we work with all of our students, because our students work in very difficult situations. Some of them are childcare workers in child welfare, so they deal with abuse and neglect. Some um, are psychiatric social workers, some are, so they often they're young people who find themselves in a position where they're witnessing or dealing with difficult circumstances. So. We have them create a, a self-care plan that helps them to, um, you know, again, hopefully reduce any of that chronic stress. So it could be anything. It could be either through <clears throat> eating better and making sure you get sufficient sleep. Um, our nurses work 12 hour shifts. Our doctors, of course, just, you know, work insane hours. Sleep is sometimes very difficult, but at least, you know, trying to get the right nu nutrition. Um, some people run. That was how I learned how to deal with the stress of working with trauma victims was I took up running. 
Um, but not everyone likes to run. My daughter hates to run. So what she does to be able to recharge herself is she paints. Um, some people look for peer support. They ask for supervision. Um, some people find that, uh, you know, their faith is really important in managing the stress. It's not about eliminating stress in the workplace. You work in a stressful place, but rather finding ways to keep moving forward, right? So finding ways to create space so that you can relax and step back and not feel like your head is always in the workspace 24-7. So, you know, this is... One of those things where, again, when we work with students, we ask them to be really specific, choose a goal around self-care, be really specific, how they're going to meet it, you know, what are the stumbling blocks they've had in the past. We monitor the plan with them as part of our supervision when they're in their clinical practice. You know, we're trying to train, and I know they do this in nursing as well, we're trying to train people. We want them to stay in the profession. We don't want them to work two years and leave um, unless you know, they find something else they really love to do and that's fine but if they're leaving because they're bitter and frustrated and they can't stand the pain then we've really failed them and in, in preparing them for the job so um, we try to work on that with with them to create plans that may again some some people say well isn't that really self-indulgent but I would say no. Actually, I feel it's really important to survival. Um, if you can't find a way to create, um, a, if you can't find a way to manage the stress, even if you love the job that you're doing, you're going to end up hating it. So you do need to do this. And if you leave, then people who could benefit, you know, won't. So we do have a secondary traumatic stress scale where uh, we sometimes use this when we're working with our students um, just to see the degree uh, when we get concerned about uh, some of the difficult things they're maybe experiencing. And then we sit down and we talk about it. So we also use some of these tools in working with them on a self-care plan. Um, these are just a bunch of some of the references. Um, if you're interested in uh, finding out more about ACEs, the Adverse Childhood Experiences, there's a ton of research about it, about how adverse childhood experiences really contribute to very poor health outcomes in middle age. And so uh, for aliostatic load and age-related disease. So um, if you're interested in that, you know, I can give you my email. I can get you those articles if you don't have access to them. This is about um, race-based trauma of, of indigenous people, um, a really good article. In, envisioning a trauma-informed service system, and it's a really important vital paradigm shift. I just recently read, uh, I have an article on uh, sexual assault in India, and uh, the, the writer, uh, who is an American-born Indian, I believe, uh, was kind of pleading, she's a physician, for India to begin to create like spaces and hospitals for women and children who've experienced trauma. Um, Post-traumatic stress disorders, uh, this is about oppression. Um, there's lots and lots of information out there. These are just a few of the references. I would... Um, I'm encouraging everyone who works in primary care to be thinking about when people come in for routine procedures or physicals or even for, you know, if they're getting a hip replaced or whatever, or a knee, um, to be trying to do trauma-informed care and doing some screening, letting people know it's okay to talk and realizing that if you're seeing some behaviors, they're most likely due to sort of a, a response from trauma, right? So if they, um, if, you know, rather than thinking that they're being a bad patient or just a pain to deal with, um, 
that it's often the response, uh, you know, that from this trauma that has been sort of re re energized by whatever procedure they're having. So I guess I would encourage you to think a little more about this. I know people may not want to talk about trauma in their past, but it doesn't, but as health professionals, we should also, we should always be prepared to keep the door open so that people will talk about it. I'd love to see a public health campaign in, um, in India and also in, well, heck, in my home community of Pittsburgh with the Depali community in which we make it safe where people feel that there's less stigma. So.